The past is littered with examples of horrible things happening. Wars, plagues, and natural disasters have impacted the human population and the planet in many negative ways. But has anything good or useful ever come out of these terrible events? Maybe if you look hard enough, there are some silver linings that could be found. The 13th century warlord Genghis Khan is known for many things. He united tribes, abolished slavery, set up a postal system. But he also killed a lot of people during the expansion of his empire. And by a lot of people, we're talking tens of millions. And some historians estimate that up to 11% of the world's population was killed during the 150 years or so that the Mongol Empire dominated the planet. So, what possible good came from that? As we know all too well, humans have a tendency to release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, whether through burning fossil fuels or cutting down useful things like trees. So removing 40 million humans in quite a small time frame had huge benefits for the planet. Presumably, this will come as no consolation for any of the deceased, but Khan's rampages, which obliterated city after city from the map, allowed areas that had been cultivated for agriculture to eventually return to their natural forested state. According to the Carnegie Institution's Department of Global Energy, Khan was the biggest eco warrior around being responsible for removing about 700 million tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. While this is about what we emit globally in a week nowadays, it did have a small but measurable impact at the time. In 2003, a study published in the American Journal of Human Genetics concluded that around 16 million or 1 in 200 men alive today is a descendant of Genghis Khan. Maybe they should get together and brainstorm carbon offset ideas for the 21st century, with the caveat that there should be no mass murder involved. Starting in the mid-14th century, the Black Death was more effective than Genghis Khan at wiping out the population. Good for it! While it's difficult to know for sure, estimates from 75 to 200 million deaths have been attributed to it as it struck down people all across Europe and Asia. In fact, we can still blame the Mongols for the speed at which the plague spread. Thanks to opening up trade routes such as the Silk Road, people could easily travel and spread the disease wherever they went. Yay! Mongol sailing ships also carried fleas and rats infected with plague around to new ports and new countries, increasing the number of carriers and victims exponentially. The Black Death is really an umbrella term for three similar plagues that tore through Europe, Asia, and the Middle East between 1348 and 1350. While the best known is the bubonic plague. You had a better chance of surviving that than if you contracted the pneumonic plague or the septicemic plague, both of which had mortality rates of nearly 100% if left untreated. So, what's the upside of all of this horror? Well, there are actually a couple of them. The first relates to that old adage, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. By studying and comparing nearly 800 skeletons for a PhD thesis, anthropologist Sharon DeWitt concluded, the results of this study indicate that mortality and survivorship improved in the generations following the Black Death and that the patterns observed are not simply an artifact of temporal changes in fertility. Basically, if you survived the first wave, you and your descendants had a better chance of living much longer during the subsequent plagues that continued to occur over the 14th century. As well as weeding out people with weaker immune systems, the plague also brought benefits to the societies that were left over. There was more food for everyone, regardless of social level. <laughs> My god, this is so dark. <laughs> there was more land available because everyone was dead. <laughs> Good lord, what are we saying? There was more land available, and also more workers were needed, meaning that people could command higher wages. For some countries, such as France or England, some of the poorest members of society started benefiting from the decrease in the workforce. They were able to increase their wages and improve their living conditions. Eventually, after this and other things, such as peasant revolts, the practices of serfdom and feudalism, where people are bound to work on land owned by someone richer, started dying out in Western Europe. Sure, because today, there's zero examples of poorer people working on richer people's land. That never happens. So apart from all the death and near collapse of society as they knew it, the people of the 14th and 15th century Europe, Asia, and the Middle East were, in general, more robust in health and wealth. Because of a lack of understanding about how the plague was spread, people started to become more open to things like questioning established religious beliefs. Existing power balances were upset, and a mix of people moving around to escape the plague brought many different cultures into contact with each other. The Black Death was one major factor that paved the way for an exit out of what's now referred to as the Dark Ages and it led to the Renaissance period and an advancement in human learning and culture.
A lot happens in London in the 17th century. Guy Fawkes and other perpetrators of the gunpowder plot tried to blow up the Houses of Parliament in 1605. The English Civil War raged from 1642 to 1651. And King Charles I was executed for treason in 1645. A king getting executed for treason. Wrap your head around that one. The plague also reared its ugly head again with multiple outbreaks over the century. The largest known as the Great Plague of London, which killed over 100,000 people in a year and a half from 1665 to 1665. On top of all that came a fire so large that it destroyed most of the city inside the old Roman walls. The fire started in Pudding Lane on September 2nd, 1666, and continued burning until September 6th. Famed diarist Samuel Pepys described that he saw the fire grow, and as it grew darker, appeared more and more, and in corners, and upon steeples, and between churches and houses, as far as we could see up the hill of the city, in a most horrid, malicious, bloody flame. Not like the fine flame of an ordinary fire. The fire spread quickly because many of the buildings were made of wood and packed tightly together. There was also a strong wind fanning the flames, and the use of fire breaks made by demolishing houses was not immediately put into action, allowing the fire to spread further and further. While it seems that most people had the chance to escape with their lives, if not their possessions, the same cannot be said for the city itself. It's estimated that over 13,000 houses and over 85 churches were destroyed. The main post office, three city gates, and a number of prisons also burned down. Landmarks such as the Royal Exchange, Old St. Paul's Cathedral, and the Customs House were devastated by the flames. The fire caused over £8 million in damage at the time, which is equivalent to around £2 billion today. But, like a phoenix rising from the ashes, this terrible event brought about a new birth for London. The fire had a cleansing effect on the dirty, plague-filled streets, as the 1666 epidemic was the last one that London experienced. As it was rebuilt, improvements were made to increase levels of general hygiene and to cut down on overcrowding by widening the streets and constructing more buildings out of stone and brick rather than wood. The seeds of the London Fire Brigade were also sown, and much-needed attention was given to constructing buildings that conformed to codes newly drawn up in the wake of the fire. Good plan. St. Paul's Cathedral was rebuilt under famed architect Sir Christopher Wren and is still one of London's most recognizable buildings. While it took the city a long time to recover, people living in rebuilt areas saw their rents plummeting as former Londoners had decamped to areas outside the city and weren't moving back. Overall, while it was a drastic way of modernizing, the Great Fire of London did end up forcing the city to improve itself, and by the 1700s, it was the most powerful city anywhere in the world. The First World War was a brutal and destructive time in history, with around 16 million people dying and the political map of Europe being extensively redrawn. The mere circumstance of being a war, however, greatly advanced technological innovation as countries rushed to bulk up their assault weapons and defenses. Aerial combat was used in World War I, despite the fact that aeroplanes had only really been around for a few years. France had fewer than 150 planes at the start of the war, for example, but by the end of it, they had produced over 4,000. Because of the huge number of injuries occurring every day, medical innovations also took a big leap forward. The first blood banks were created, and things we take for granted these days, like leg splints, greatly increased a soldier's survival rate. Marie Curie invented smaller, more robust X-ray machines that could be put in vehicles and transported across battlefields, allowing medical staff to locate shrapnel and fractures in their patients. Sociologically, women took up more of a productive role in many countries, and this led to women over 30 getting the right to vote in England in 1918, paving the way for anyone over the age of 21 to be able to vote in 1928. Another huge and lasting innovation came out of World War I in a slightly more roundabout way. US firm Kimberly Clark used their trademarked extra-absorbent cellular cotton to manufacture surgical dressings when the US entered the war in 1917. A year later, the war came to an end, and the military no longer had a use for much of this material. Thanks to the Red Cross nurses who had been using it for their own personal needs, Kimberly Clark pivoted to making a product that half the population needs every month. The first commercially produced sanitary towels under the name Kotex were born in 1920, and the cellular cotton boom didn't stop there. In 1924, the material was smoothed out and sold as facial tissues under the name Kleenex.
There wasn't much to celebrate when Chernobyl nuclear power plant number four reactor exploded in April 1986, as well as two people dying in the explosion. A further 28 died shortly afterwards due to acute radiation exposure. Over a quarter of a million people had to be relocated from areas immediately around the plants, and a huge amount of contamination was released into the air, spreading over the rest of Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia. Unlikely though it seems, the disaster did have some positive benefits almost immediately following the explosion. There was the help and cooperation between East and West over nuclear safety and improved power plant designs. Mikhail Gorbachev credits the Chernobyl explosion as having been instrumental in the dissolution of the Soviet Union. While the long-term health effects of all the airborne radiation on humans has not been conclusive, it seems that the local wildlife hasn't been too badly affected by the disaster in the long run. The Chernobyl Exclusion Zone, which covers an area around the plant of about 1,000 square miles or 2,600 square kilometers, is actually now a thriving area of biodiversity and a haven for many different species of mammal. Numbers of elk and deer are at similar levels in the radioactively contaminated site as other comparable reserves elsewhere in Ukraine and Belarus. The wolf population is booming thanks to a lack of human predators which is scary. <laughs> the overall takeaway is that anything that forces humans out of an area is eventually going to be good for the environment, even if it takes a nuclear disaster to do it. So I really hope you enjoyed today's video. <laughs> enjoyed this was savage lie there's a like button below leave a comment give me a suggestion for a future video and thanks for watching